Hey, this is Aaron Rabinowitz for CreativeCow.net. In this tutorial, I'm going to introduce you to Shape Layers, a feature new in After Effects CS3. To explain this as simply as possible, Shape Layers are an implementation of Adobe Illustrator features in After Effects, but kind of on steroids. So basically, in Illustrator, you have the ability to create shapes, like this, and then you can go into the effects and then add an effect like pucker and bloat for example. Now in After Effects you can do the same thing but so much more because the shapes and effects can be animated and also repeated. In fact this feature is so robust that I can't even begin to cover it in a short tutorial and, and possibly not even in a, a few long ones. It, it's really that robust. Let's take a brief look at shape layers and hopefully it will give you an idea of what you can do with it. The easiest way to create a shape layer is to activate one of the shape tools up here. I need to point out that previously these were the mask shape tools and while they still can be used to create masks in different shapes, if you have no layer selected when clicking in the composition window, they will create a new shape layer. I'll use the star tool and with no layer selected, I'll click drag in the timeline to create the star. Okay, let's look at some of the options here. First, up here we have quick access to the fill and stroke colors and styles. I'll click on the word fill, which brings up a dialog, which among other things, allows me to choose the type of fill. For example, I can choose to have no fill, a single color fill, a linear gradient fill, and finally, a radial gradient fill. I'll stick with this last option and I'll click OK. Then, I'll click on the fill color box, and in the dialog, I can change the colors. So I'll make this red into a blue by selecting the color stop and then going into the color picker area and changing it to a blue. I can also add a color if I want by clicking anywhere along in the gradient. So I'll click in the middle and I'll add a reddish orange color. By the way, the stops on top of the gradient are opacity stops that allow you to change the opacity along the gradient. I'll add a stop right in the middle and set it to 50% opacity. You won't see any major difference for now, but later when we add a repeater, you'll see the effect that it has. Click OK to confirm the settings. Then let's quickly look at the stroke options by clicking on the word stroke. As you can see, we pretty much have the same options that we did in the fill options. You can have no stroke, a single color as we already had, a linear gradient, and finally, a radial gradient, which you may not get much out of unless your stroke lines are really thick. I'll keep it set to single color, and I'll click OK. Finally, we have the stroke thickness, and you can just change this number to increase the thickness of the stroke. I'll set it to 4. Now, let's take a look at some more of the shape layer options in the timeline, and there are a lot. Too many to cover here, in fact. Let's twirl down the property called Polystar, which contains all of the shape layer properties for this shape. And in there, let's twirl down the Polystar Path property. As a side note, you can have more than one shape on a shape layer, which can lead to some complex shapes and animations, but I'm not going to cover that here. Let me highlight some of the important properties here in the timeline. Points determines how many points the star has. I always like to crank that sucker up a bit. Then we have the inner radius, which determines how much of the star is devoted to the body versus the points. Below that, we have the outer radius, which determines the length of the star points. Then we have the inner roundness and outer roundness, which determine the roundness of the star angles at the points and on the star's body. Playing with these values in conjunction with the inner and outer radius property can yield some very interesting results. You should definitely take some time to play around with that. But for now, I'll twirl up the polystar path options and move on. Twirl down the stroke options, and in there, let's look at the property called dashes. Using this feature, you can turn the stroke into dashes by clicking on the plus button, and you'll notice two new options that appear. The first is called dash, and this property determines the length of each dash. Higher numbers yield larger dashes further apart from each other. If you click on the plus button again, it will reveal an additional property called gap, which determines the distance between each dash. Below that is offset. Like many other properties, this value is animatable. 
and if you scrub it, you can see that your dashes will rotate around the boundaries of your shape layer if you set animation keyframes. By the way, when I use dashes, I like to set the line cap property up here to round cap, which creates rounded edges for the dashes. It's just my thing. I like the way it looks. For now though, I'll just go to one property above that and set the stroke width to zero, which makes the stroke disappear. Just want to point out that this is not the same as having no stroke, because again, you can animate this value and have the stroke grow in thickness. If you had used the stroke options that we discussed earlier to either create or alter your shape to have no outer stroke, then you wouldn't be able to do that. Now you may notice that at the top of the shape layer properties here in the timeline, there's an add button. And this allows us to add certain effects to shape layers. So I'll click on that, and in the flyout menu, you may recognize some or most of these options from Illustrator. I'm going to choose the one called Twist. And as I do that, you can see that in the timeline, a new property called Twist has been added. Twirl it down, and a property called Angle appears. And as you may have guessed, playing with this value will make the shape layer twist itself. I'm also going to add another effect again by clicking on the Add button. And from there, choosing Pucker and Bloat. I've always loved this effect, even though I never quite got what exactly it was doing. It certainly looks cool, though. In the timeline, you'll see a new property called Pucker and Bloat, and if you twirl that down, you'll see a property called Amount. Playing with that property, you can see that you get very different results as you move between negative and positive values. I'm going to add yet another property, again by clicking on the Add button, and in the Flyout menu, I'll choose Repeater. As you might have guessed, the repeater creates copies of the shape, but you can offset the position and transformation properties for the repeated layers, which can help you in creating cool motion graphics backgrounds and effects. You may notice that we can see through the shape to the repeated shape behind it, and that's because earlier we made the gradient partially transparent. In the timeline, twirl down the repeater property, and you'll see that we have a few more properties here. I'll set the number of copies up to seven. Now you won't see much difference yet, but if I zoom out, you can see that our shape layer extends past the edge of our screen. That's because all of the duplicates are off to this one side. Back in the timeline, below the copies property, you'll find offset. We'll come back to that in a little bit. For now, twirl down the transform repeater property, and in there, you'll see a bunch of transform properties. Let's set the scale property to 80. As you can see, the shape to the right gets smaller. In fact, each progressive shape is 80% the size of the previous shape. So the second shape is 80% the original, and the next copy is 80% of 80%, which is 64%. You may notice that the position property is set to 100 on the x-axis by default. I'll set this to 50, which moves the repeated copies closer together. I'll also set the end opacity to 0, which makes the shapes go from 100% opacity at the first shape to 0% opacity at the last. Finally, I'll set the rotation to 20 degrees so that each successive shape is rotated more and more. Now I'm going to jump back up to the repeater's offset, and this is where things get cool. At the first frame of my timeline, I'll set a keyframe with a value of 8. Then I'll move down to about the 2 second mark, and I'll set it to a value of negative 30. Do a RAM preview and you can see some nice animation. The offset value offsets all of the transformations that we made here, so as you change the offset, the shapes will, for example, move over 50 pixels on the X and rotate 20 degrees and scale up, giving it the illusion that the line of shapes is moving and getting closer to the camera. But in fact, all it's really doing is transforming the shapes based on our repeater transform values. And I have to tell you, if you animate the repeater's transform properties over time, such as the anchor point, for example, you may get some really interesting results. And of course, you can use motion blur with the animation. Just make sure that motion blur is turned on for both the layer and the composition. But keep in mind that this will create a render hit, sometimes a heavy one. Okay, so that's my introduction to shape layers. Hopefully, that will get you started. I hope to cover more cool stuff with this tool in the future. Once again, this is Aaron Rabinowitz for creativecow.net.